Well, you're all very welcome uh, to the IIEA this afternoon. Uh, just before I go on to introduce our speaker, the usual housekeeping uh, uh, rules. Um, mobile phones either off or certainly on silent, please. And uh, Van Vondal's address when it comes will be um, on the record, but the question and answer which will follow will be under the, uh, the Chatham House rules. Um, I'm just thinking that, you know, and given the news this morning, Brexit does seem to consume all of our time and attention uh, these days, but it's good to be reminded uh, of the much more wide-ranging scope of this um, institute's ongoing work, and that includes uh, the broader question of the future of the EU, presumably an EU of, of 27, and the various issues that are posed uh, in that context, uh, greater or lesser integration, the future of the euro, institutional change, and, and so on. And on one aspect of that, namely um, the EU and its place um, and potential in our changing world, we've had the benefit already at the IIEA in, in recent days of sharing views with a, a distinguished speaker from Chicago, the Council on Foreign Relations there, uh, on the apparent abdication of United States uh, leadership <coughs> in the world. And yesterday from a speaker, Dr. Biscop, from the Egmont Institute <coughs> on EU external relations in an era of great powers. So to continue in this vein, today's address is on opportunities for the European Union in a changing international order. And it's a great pleasure to welcome and introduce our speaker, Baron uh, Franz von Dahl, uh, to this theme. He brings a very uh, varied and deep experience uh, to his presentation on the EU role and potential in a world undergoing significant repositioning of the major global powers. He has represented his own country, uh, Belgium, a founder member of the EU, in a number of positions bearing on the European Union and Europe, including as Director General for Political Affairs, Permanent Representative to the EU from 1997 to 2002, and Chief of Staff to Foreign Minister Leterme. Most recently, he has been Chief of Staff to His Majesty the King of the Belgians. Um, secondly, serving in the broader European Union framework, uh, Mr. Van Dahl has been Chief of Staff to the first president of the European Council, that institution as, as set up under the Lisbon Treaty, Herman van Rompuy, from uh, late 2009, I think, until 2012. This is a position, obviously, at the heart of the EU's internal workings, but also a post with a significant international profile, not least in the uh, Sherpa role conferred, conferred on the Chief of Staff for uh, broader international meetings, not least uh, the G7 and um, the G8. And finally, outside the strictly EU domain, uh, Baron von Dahl has served as Belgian ambassador to the United States from 2002 to 2006, Belgian ambassador to NATO from 2007 to 2009, and I know that he has lectured at and retains uh, links with Stanford, with Johns Hopkins, and in Europe with the, the College uh, de l'Europe. So drawing on these multiple uh, vantage points, we certainly look forward uh, to your address at a time when, as a former Irish uh, permanent representative to the EU, which sure is here today, Bobby McDonough, as he wrote in yesterday's newspaper, has said, the EU is seen by many as a bulwark in the defense of the infrastructure of decency and rational debate, which generations of us have striven to build up. The floor is yours. <coughs> Thank you. Thank you very much for your introductory remarks. Uh, in the first par part, I will be slightly, be slightly more diplomatic than in the second part. Um, <clears throat> but I was used to this uh, kind of convention when I f came to uh, the first time to the Institute uh, five years ago. I would <clears throat> like to share with you some thoughts about uh, the way uh, the world is moving full speed ahead toward a new world disorder 
And then I would like to say a couple of, uh, to share with you a couple of my thoughts on uh, the place of the European Union in there. My bottom line is very simple. The world is in disorder, so more than ever we need a strong European Union, and, uh, but you don't need me to know that. First of all, the, the, the world disorder. Um, <clears throat> like some of you, uh, I remember how the first wave of globalization, which I call the first wave of globalization between 1960 and 1990, just overwhelmed us in the 60s. Remember in the 60s when I was in high school, we had five hours of uh, Greek, five hours of Latin, five hours of French, four hours of Dutch, and only in the three last years of high school, every week, one hour of German and one hour of English. So the Anglo-Saxon world was not on the screen yet. Then came <coughs> Dr. No and West Side Story and Le Défi Américain. And so we were living in this first wave of uh, globalization, just mentioning two particularities of this uh, uh, first wave of globalization. It was partial in the sense that it only extended to the countries which were allies of the United States or were living in, uh, under the American umbrella, it was a partial. And secondly, it was an organized globalization. Uh, we had structures which, the, which had been built under American leadership since the Second World War. We had the WTO, we had, uh, we had the Bretton Woods institutions and so on. We had NATO and we had leadership, American leadership. So this first wave of globalization worked actually quite well. It was structured and it was led. Then happens the fall of the Berlin Wall. And then we see that the United, we won the Cold War, like President <coughs> Bush uh, uh, said, <coughs> we discovered that the United States, having won the Cold War, started a slow, inexorable process of withdrawal from uh, global responsibilities. Uh, this withdrawal during the second wave, second wave of globalization after 1990, after the fall of the Berlin Wall, the second wave of globalization, this <coughs> in the second wave of globalization, we had this American withdrawal on the one hand. It took different forms with Democrat, Democratic presidents and Republican presidents. <coughs> On the democratic side, there was an increasing reticence against military intervention. On the Republican side, withdrawal took the form of trying to withdraw from the multilateral system. And so instead of being in a world which was strongly structured and which was led, like we were in the first wave of globalization, in the second wave, we have the absence, the withdrawal of the, uh, the American disengagement. What was filling the void? Basically, the void was being filled with Asia, China more in particular, and even today, uh, it's so obvious that in the sec during the second wave of globalization, there was a gigantic shift of power from west to east. Look at it ideologically. I mean, the Chinese will always tell you that it's perfectly possible to have prosperity without liberty. The, they are quite vocal about the, what they think about or democratic, etc. values. So there was an ideological shift. There was, of course, a military shift. If you see the military build up in Asia, it is quite impressive. And there was, of course, a uh, shift of economic power. So you, in the second wave, you have this withdrawal from its uh, 
traditional responsibilities by the United States, and you had the void being filled, not by the European Union, but in Asia. So where does that, does that lead uh, us? We are now reverting to uh, a disorderly world. We have known that in our past in Europe. Uh, you have a world of shifting alliances. You have a world with arms race. You have a world without much of a rule book. So this uh, has become something much more unpredictable than we knew in the past. Some people say, well, what is going to define this uh, the time we are, the times we are living in, it's going to be the rivalry between an emerging power, China, and a declining power, the United States. And <clears throat> this book of uh, Graham Allison uh, about Thucydides's trap is worth reading. He tries to prove that we're generally speaking a declining power meets an emerging power that ends in war, save in one case he describes, which is between the United States and the United Kingdom, and he tries now to define, uh, he tries now to define the conditions under which uh, between China and the United States uh, a rivalry should remain under control. Now, <clears throat> um, Graham's book was written, I think, before the presidential election in the United States. Because what we are seeing is not necessarily uh, conducive uh, to a, a more stable uh, situation. Uh, it's clear that China has been put on the defensive. The, um, the rule which uh, the Chinese uh, leadership had been following is we just have to bide our time. And I put this nearly under quotation marks because I think it has been used several times even in official uh, statements. And I think the uh, arrival of President Trump was a surprise to them, as it may have been a surprise to many others. And so that the timing, we have the time to bide our time, is not necessarily there anymore. And so they are, I think, on the defensive. On the American side, President Trump, <clears throat> in a way, is representative of both the Republican strain of withdrawal and the Democratic strain of withdrawal, like I define them. But he has become aware that you cannot just withdraw from responsibility. And he has been compensating that phenomenon of which, uh, in certain ways, he's an expression. He has been compensating that by expounding and practicing this America first theory. It hides, in a way, the, withdrawal, the ongoing withdrawal, I think, of the United States from a number of its responsibilities. So yes, there is a void. Yes, there is disorder. Yes, the, uh, the President of the United States is aware of that. He tries in a way to fill it in his own fashion. Uh, and, <clears throat> and so, when you follow American politics, we all know there is much more to it than just the antics. Now, where is Europe in all that?
We have been doing rather well economically, even externally. Climate agreement, the deal with Iran, um, trade, norms and standards. So there are a number of things we have been doing well, and which are part of filling the void. Enlargement was a success as well. So people should know that, yes, we have been exporting stability. Yes, we have been contributing to filling the void. But uh, we show as well every day a lot of weaknesses. Um, I think we suffer from a number of divisions internally uh, between North and South. The whole story about solidarity between East and West, the whole story about balance between national sovereignty and commonality. Externally, well, we have diplomatically too many players on the book. Militarily speaking, uh, we are, there are a couple of building blocks around, but uh, nobody is dealing with us. I mean, no external factor is dealing with us with the idea at the back of its head that uy, uy, these guys, they can be quite dangerous. So uh, our weaknesses are glaring. Uh, we have a number of merits, but our weaknesses are glaring. And so what can we do about it? Are the political conditions there to do something about it? Will the conditions be there, let's say, after Brexit? Because Britain, rightly and wrongly, uh, or wrongly, has been uh, scapegoated for having made a number of things impossible. Sometimes they did make things impossible, but not always. But when you move over and beyond Brexit, what? Uh, are we uh, then going going to do? Um, who is going to be in the driving seat? Well, I think the traditional driver, the Franco-German couple, doesn't seem to me, at the time of speaking, politically strong, I hope they are, because they are indispensable to our common interest, but uh, they, uh, the political, the domestic difficulties, both in France and in Germany, are not in themselves uh, very promising on uh, a very active Franco-German couple. Again, I hope I'm wrong, but it's not uh, helping for the time being, I think. Uh, then our own public opinions, populism, uh, and sort of make it even more difficult. Still, um, what should we try and do, nevertheless? First of all, in the short term, we should try and complete and finish the two main um, questions we, uh, of deepening we put on the table after the fall of the Berlin Wall is the common currency and the common border. I think we are rather far as, as the common currency is concerned. I hope that in December uh, the last uh, knots will be tied on issues like the, the European Monetary Fund, the transformation of the European stability mechanism into a European Monetary Fund. I hope that we will make progress on, uh, uh, in respect to the deposit uh, protection. Uh, but on the common currency, a lot has been done as a consequence and during the euro crisis. Then the common border, a number of measures to strengthen the border have been taken. I think the negotiations with the Turks and uh, with whomever is in power in Libya made a huge difference as well in the number of people flee uh, coming across the, uh, the Mediterranean. 
but still, I think on that second one, there is more to be done than on the common currency, because the crisis of the common border has come so much later than the crisis of the common uh, currency. And uh, just building strong, uh, strong borders is only part of the answer. So we have to look at something which is genuinely difficult. It's a common asylum policy, common immigration policy. We have tried that a couple of times in the past. It didn't work out because for the simple reason is that, of course, your immigration policy is very much a, national, a matter of national competence, national power, and national politics. And what is possible in one country is not possible in the other country. I remember uh, being being uh, in the chair of the uh, of the committee of permanent representatives and trying to do something on common in immigration policy. The, at that time, the differences between the sensitivities in Germany and the sensitivities in uh, France were uh, were extreme. So you couldn't build out of that a kind of a common uh, position, and I think ba mainly we are still there. Uh, but just having a tight border is important, is part of the solution, but there are a number of corollaries which are difficult to make. But well, these are the kinds of subjects for which the Brussels machine is well equipped. Uh, that kind of negotiation, it's uh, complex and complicated, and as long as things are complex and complicated, we tend to be good at it. Look at the Brexit. <laughs> Just to, con uh, to conclude uh, there, <clears throat> in the longer term, I think we have a problem of methodology. Uh, you can approach further integration either through the road of objectives, and aims, or you can approach it to the road of means and instruments. Um, as far as our aims are concerned, we have been rather successful in explaining in the past to a public opinion that the European Union had a, a value added in, uh, in terms of security and prosperity. And people accepted that. They could see it. The next step, which some people, like my former Prime Minister Guy Verhofstadt, is trying to make, is to put the, uh, to ask the question about our common institutions. And then uh, he has written about it extensively in his uh, book, uh, The United States of Europe, to which I contributed my own little part. Um, it's obvious that uh, member states, uh, even if the pressure heaped upon them uh, uh, were to be much higher, it is obvious that uh, for most member states, going further in terms of political integration, going th further in terms of transferring additional powers to, uh, to Brussels, and given the state of public opinion, is something which is uh, not obvious for them to do. But we should try, nevertheless, to continue developing a narrative about why are we making Europe. We lose a lot of credit with public opinion because we do not explain sufficiently, because we disagree on it, over and beyond, I mean, prosperity and security, what is this game all about? And. Well, there are a couple of discussions which have taken place already in the European Council, discussions to come, discussions you have here. But how can you define a common objective in Europe for, uh, for the uh, for our European integration pro process, a common objective which is credible and credible in the sense that people say, well, this is a smart thing to do, and moreover, yes, uh, this could be politically acceptable. And I'm. Not, I don't think we have already found and defined that, but we shouldn't stop thinking about it. The other way to approach uh, European integration is the old uh, Schumann method, step by step and uh, organic growth. And if you have an internal market that leads inexorably to a, to a common currency uh, union. Um, and I think that uh, in daily life, that remains, to my view, the only practical way in advancing uh, Europe. But by using that, that way of doing business, uh, 
at the same time, you do it at the price of not explaining what you are really, really doing. You Well, you say, well, I do this, and then after a year, people will discover you have to do this. But you have not explained why we are doing this. So this remains for, the, for us all quite a daunting challenge to which I don't have uh, a precise answer. One thing which, and I would uh, leave, it, uh, leave it there, given the state of disorder of the world, we will come again and again to the question of common foreign policy and common defense. Um, I think that <clears throat> as far as common defense is concerned, the one uh, country which has most to offer in that respect is France, given the simple fact that they have the strongest military and the hugest military investments. Uh, but are the conditions there for them to play that card? They have already been instrumental in two things. That was the cooperation structurée permanente and the uh, the intervention initiative, those are important steps. Uh, we have a nucleus, of, uh, um, a nucleus of headquarters in Brussels, that's an important step. So we have been doing bits and pieces, but when will the conditions be right for these bits and pieces to come together so that then and only then Europe will be become a real factor of power in the world and be part of filling the void? The, um, uh, I'm not sure that, uh, let me leave it at that, that soft power without hard power is real power. Thank you.